I am your host, JP John Paz. With me, of course, is the former WCW and ECW World Tag Team Champion, one of the greatest minds and bookers ever in the history of the business, the Games Master, the Taskmaster, the Devil himself, Mr. Kevin Sullivan. Kevin, how are you doing today, sir? Good, JP. As far as the topic at hand, I want to talk about old school WCW. I want to go back to 1990. I want to talk about Wrestle War, which was February 25th from the Greensboro Coliseum in Greensboro, North Carolina. The attendance 7,900. The pay per view buys 175K. So, pretty good buy as far as the, the pay per view. 7,900, not that big time, though, as far as the live attendance because. AEW just had a show there, and Sting was the you know the main event of his retirement match. They just drew fifteen thousand people, so well, not a huge house here for Greensboro, but decent though. Seventy nine hundred is pretty good. Yeah, and you got to realize that was Sting's last match. I mean, what would yes, they have drawn yeah, it. Was Sting's last match? You know what I mean? Right. Yep. Not that. Yep. Yep. So as far as one seventy five k though, that pretty good buy rate though as right. far as the show. The interesting right. thing is the show is a little bit in flux because Sting was originally supposed to be feuding with Flair at this point. But as you know, Starcade 89, he wins the round robin tournament, becomes the number one contender for the title, then gets injured at Clash of the Champions. Before that, gets kicked out of the horse room because they don't want him, which we've talked about before, they don't want him getting the title shot against Flair, which was awesome the way they did it at Clash of Champions 10. Which then, of course, set up later on the night. Sting tries to climb the cage, and he yeah. hurts his knee really bad. So then you guys have to put Luger in that spot. Does that suck? Everything was for four months. Everything is going to be Sting Flair. Everything's pushing that direction, and he gets hurt. Boom, just like that. You have to change gears. Yeah. It was strange how he got hurt. Remember? Getting pulled down from the outside. Yep, from Came the cage, down. yeah. I guess it was yeah. Doug Dillinger kind of doing it, yeah. Yeah, I came down and got hurt. Too too bad. So when you're looking at it, Sting gets hurt. He, he's got to move aside. Luger has to turn from heel to face. Is that ruined, like, the booking as far as what you've got planned? Because it seems like that's not maybe where he was going to be headed at this point in time. He was yeah. not going to be a baby face. Well, it certainly doesn't help. You know, you got something laid out, and you had Sting uh, as the lead babyface, and they were keeping, you know, the match with him and Luger in their back pocket. You know, it's what we talked about earlier. It, you could have had a three-way combination of anything. <clears throat> so, yeah, it it it, it hurt. Then when you think about it, it's like, okay, if things hurt, what do we do? Do you have to switch Luger from heel to face? And is that going to work? It does seem like it worked here because he was saying he wanted to avenge Sting. And he, he basically was saying, I'm really friends with this guy. And you guys heard him. That's not the way you know we do business here. So do you think it worked in the crowd's eyes that Luger was going to be the baby face? Yeah, I do think so. Yeah, I mean, because Sting was so beloved, you know what I mean? And it made sense that him and Luger were to be friendly outside of the business. So, yeah. So, obviously, he's going to be a babyface here. He is getting over. Do you think that ruins plans going forward, though, for Luger? Like, in months in advance, that you're switching him face to heel, face to heel? Or does that not necessarily matter? Well, of course it matters. But when you put in this position, there's nothing you can do. You know? Or that's the best option, you believe, anyway. Does it hurt his credibility? I, I think we've changed so much from babyface to heel that it doesn't even matter anymore. Also, when, it, when back in the day, a guy turned heel once in his life from being a babyface, you know what I mean? Or a baby face to a heel. But, I mean, how many times have guys flip-flop in WWE? And also to know Luger did this kind of a few years ago. He was the heel with the horseman, and he turned baby face. Then he turned heel again. Now he's a face again. So he's flip-flopped a little bit here so far in, in the late 80s. Quite a bit. Quite a bit. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Quite a bit. 
he was a guy maybe you couldn't trust, but you, you did get behind his charisma and everything else. I mean, he was easy to root for. Oh, uh, he was easy to work with for me. Maybe because I knew him before, you know, when he was training with Hero. I mean, he he was uh, Johnny on the spot. Yeah, why do you think he gets sometimes a bad reputation of being, oh, hard to work with? It seems like you had nothing but easy work with him. Well, uh, maybe it's because him and I had that relationship that I knew him from the beginning. And uh, we hit it off in a business way when he broke in. Uh, so I think that had something to do with, I think years later, he was maybe not comfortable with a lot of people directing his career. Because so, him and I had, had the relationship of me starting out with him, and I, I was straight shooting with him. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, he could, feels like he could trust you more. You, you were honest yeah. with him. Yeah. So also around this time for your period around Wrestle War, Ron Simmons and Butch Reed are unmasked as Doom. Did you like them under a mask, or you thought that was kind of silly? Because it was obvious who it was under the mask. Well... I, I thought it had a little dimension, but everybody knowing who they are, I don't think it hurt because we kind of copied that. That's when we had the committee, correct? Yes. And we copied that out of, you know, in Mexico, there had been guys that people knew who they were, luchadors that put on masks, you know what I mean? But it was just something we we're trying to spotlight them and they really didn't need it, like you said. But it was just us trying to put a little intrigue into them because they had been there in and out. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah. So another interesting thing is Ruse, R-O-O-S, is going to be a sponsor. And they're going to obviously be all over the ring posts, which is something different. Really don't see that too much, except for maybe WW Slim Jim when you guys would have around the post for Halloween Havoc and different things like that. But do you like that having the the sponsor on the ring post like that? I don't care if it's if it's bringing in a lot of money, but if it wasn't bringing in a lot of money, and I wasn't privy to what they would bring in, no. Nah. But if they're bringing in a lot of money, like uh, uh, Slim Jim was, yeah, sure. Do it was remember, only one event. Do you remember Ruse? Do you remember the shoes? Yeah, the kangaroos. With you. They had the little zippers on the side. Yeah. Remember you them? like that? Yeah. Do I like the shoe? Yeah. No. Piece of crap. <laughs> crap. <laughs> yeah, they didn't they last apart. long. They weren't around no. for a long time. No, they fell apart all the time. <laughs> Did you get some freebies? Did they give you some freebie? Oh, yeah, but they were... You know they're not worth anything when the wrestlers aren't even taking them. You know? <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Do you like that Logan Paul's drink Prime is now going to be on the ring itself? Do you like it being being on the actual ring mat? Yeah. Sure. Sure. Okay, you're on your own. I got to get to the gym. I don't know. I'm probably gonna pick him up at four o'clock. So I gotta get the gym before three. Okay. Go ahead, JP. Do you, you like that? You like that the prime drink is on the ring, gonna be on the mat? Uh why not? You know what I mean? If we're going that way. We're gonna go that way anyway. You know what I mean? It's like uh doesn't UFC have all kinds of shit over the, on the rings? Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah, so uh, haven't they kind of... Uh, they're the same company now, right? Yep, TKO. Basically merger, under yep. the same umbrella. Yeah, yeah. Yep. So, and they're... They want to make as much money as they possibly can. 
they got a lot of money out. So yeah, and I think they're pretty smart that they did it with Paul. You know what I mean? What do you think of that? I like it because obviously WCW used to do it back in the day. I mean, you, you had stuff on, on the ring and, and different stuff. So, I mean, I've seen it before in wrestling, so I don't know why people were complaining about it. I like it. I, I have no issue with it whatsoever. I feel like WWE and Vince might have been against it, but that was a, an un, um, unused part of merchandising or, you know, as far as licensing that they could have been doing and making a ton of money off of it. Right. I mean, don't you have you seen a soccer match where they all have advertising on their uniforms? Yep. So, I mean, <clears throat> do I want to see it on the wrestlers' tights and outfits? No. But you've got to make as much money as you can in today's day. When they, what, what do they put out for WWE? $9.3 billion? Yep. Am I correct? Yep. And then <clears throat> how much was UFC? Nine something. Right. Yep. You gotta make that They're money alive. back. You gotta make that money back. Oh, when they intend to. They're they're going to for yeah. sure. Yeah. Now, this Wrestle War, of course, is called Wild Thing, and that's the, the catchphrase here. As the show opens, we have Jim Ross and Terry Funk calling the action. Ross literally worked with everybody, but I love him and Funk together. I mean, there's a million combinations of Ross, but I do love Ross and Funk. They are great together. You like Funk as an announcer, or you much rather have him wrestling? Oh, I, I'd rather have Terry wrestle, but he's a great announcer. He adds a yeah. different dynamic to it. He obviously in 89 proved that, man, he still got it. He was unbelievable in that feud with Flair. And then he just hopped right into the, the announce booth with, with Jim Ross right after that. So interesting kind of dynamic there. He was basically the biggest heel in the company. Now he's the announcer. Yeah, Terry could do anything. Terry could do so anything. Start... Oh, absolutely. So we start off with... Gordon Soli in the back interviewing Teddy Long, talking about the Chicago street fight. Later on, we find out that Sid Vicious is injured, won't be a part of it. He'll be replaced by Mean Mark Callis. And the other wrestler is going to be the masked skyscraper, who is, of course, Mike Enos under a hood, just to set the stage for later on. Sid's injury, I mean, is that, is that a real killer for you? Like, as far as you lose Sting, now you lose Sid? Of course. Of course, I mean, since it was a big star, imposing presence, you know what I mean? Do you feel snake bitten when you have these injuries right around pay per view time? Uh, no, what can you do? It's part of the business. So it's you know, like it's NFL like every working. week, next man up? Yeah. Can put him on for you? Yeah. So, uh, that was against me? Yeah. So, where I'm going with this is. You gotta understand that injuries are part. Back then, they weren't as prevalent as they are now. Uh, and here's the thing I think about: they didn't have mats on the floor, and now guys are getting injured more because I think they don't work quite as enough for their body to toughen up. Do you know what I mean? And yeah, they maybe, work like half the schedule. Yeah, and maybe their timing is off that we wouldn't recognize it, but they do just a millimeter, and that gets them in the position. But getting back to the subject, yeah, you got to be prepared that the worst is going to be happening. Speaking of injury, we'll talk about that in the first match. But first up, it's Kevin Sullivan, you, and Buzz Sawyer versus the Dynamic Dudes. At first, when you look at your team, you guys are starting a new stable. So it's you, Buzz, and Cactus Jack, and you're going to call it the Slaughterhouse. What are your memories of this pretty awesome stable as far as who's in it? Oh, yeah. I mean, Buzz was a magnet. You, you know that, right? Uh, the only time I've ever been knocked out in the ring, Buzz missed giving me a tag and smacked me in the head. I almost went out. Uh, he was an intense 
He had the frog splash before Eddie. Do you remember that? Yep. He had a pretty a, athletic, yep. Incredible power slam. He was a very good amateur wrestler. He was wicked strong. And uh, he was a bully. And he was out of his mind. And not, not in a good way out of his mind. No, no. He had, as many of us did, he had a problem back in the day, but he was the king of the problems. <laughs> yes, gotcha. With him and you and Foley, obviously, like I said, the slaughterhouse, how come that doesn't go further? I know we'll, we'll, Buzz's injury comes up, and we'll talk about that a little bit, but did you want that to go further? Or oh, yeah. As far as that? yeah. That was a great combination, I thought. You know, I Mick has mentioned this in his book and in, in interviews. When uh, they brought him in to WCW, uh, you know, it was to be an enhancement <clears throat> and uh jimmy told me he gives a great elbow off the apron right and uh so then after the first match he's on i beat his had his opponent get beat uh no his partner get beat and he got thrown out on the floor i don't know if mick threw him on the floor but the partner ended up on the floor and then cactus runs the length of the apron and jumps and gives him a elbow well i got cactus over by doing that week after week oh he got himself over right uh but he was jumping down after after the partner lost the match so i had i saw what cactus could do real early you know what i mean right up close so you have him the incredible bump man the incredible interview uh more intelligent maniac on the interviews then i had buzz who could amateur wrestler great moves as professional wrestler a just complete madman and uh screaming interviews shit flying out of his mouth when he's yelling and then you had me uh, holding the supposedly holding it together with these two guys because they were almost come to blows. It was a great, great, I thought, stable. And you could have turned Mick Babyface, and he could have, with their help, he could have become a huge babyface back then, starting with us and then moving on to the horse. I like it. I, I could see that uh, for sure. So this match, though, of course, you guys, it's you and Buzz versus the dynamic dudes. What is up with this gimmick? Johnny Ace seems like he's into it. Shane does not seem like he's very much into it. And here, there's no skateboards. The skateboards are gone. What's going on here with the dynamic dudes? Uh, this was a Jim Hurd production. Now, I don't know. can't remember if they had said they don't and rightfully so we don't want the skateboards and heard okay it or if uh the committee just said overruled heard and said they don't need the skateboards but it was it was a in my head it was a terrible gimmick to lay on those young guys you know what Man, I mean? that gimmick that gimmick stunk to holy hell. Yeah, Dyna even the name Dynamic Dude is pretty lame. Yeah, it made them lame. So, so you guys get the win, like you mentioned, with the the, from the flying spa splash. Sawyer comes off the top, nails the splash, and they get the win. The only problem is, and this was a good match and a good opener, the only problem is he breaks his wrist yeah. on the splash. Thank you. Yeah, I know. I know. Did, did you did, have you ever seen that? Uh, yeah, YouTube oh, yeah, <laughs> yep. Oh, ah, uh, he was, uh, and when you see it, it's bent all the way back. Gross, yep, yeah, 
Yeah. So you guys get the win in 10 minutes, 15 seconds, but Sawyer gets hurt. And is that why the slaughterhouse is kind of going to maybe go dormant or maybe get a little more quiet because of the injury here? It's just by Sawyer. Absolutely. Absolutely. When you look at that injury, though, I mean, like we said, Sting's injured, Sid's injured. Man, now Buzz Sawyer gets hurt. You guys are definitely snake bitten just as far as the injuries in and around this pay per view. Right, right. I mean, nothing you could do. That's the thing about it. There's nothing you could lay everything out. It's like Punk. I'm sure Punk's return is going to miss this WrestleMania. And I actually think. Not that no one's not going to go, but I think he would add it another dimension. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. Now, he's not really gone or, or out for, for too long after this injury. Were you surprised that this injury kind of didn't take him out? Well, I mean, well, he was out for a while, but are you surprised this injury didn't like end his career or anything like that? I mean, oh, yeah, he is out. Yeah. He's out for a while, but I mean, it's not like a career end or anything. Are you surprised that hey, toughness, maybe? JP, ball players get hit in the wrist with 100 mile an hour fastballs. Doesn't put them out for the season. Right. You know, so uh, a wrist is a. Probably the best, not that any of them are good, but probably the best injury if you're going to break something. It heals a lot quicker. It isn't like uh, your legs or your back, you know what I'm saying? Or yep. your knee. He did slow down, though, as far as wrestling tremendously after this, and he really didn't wrestle too much after this. Obviously, he's been around the block forever at this point, too. Do you feel like that was just kind of... Uh, the beginning of the end, maybe for for his wrestling, or like what what did you think about just his his career? Jitter? Obviously, he dies in, in in the next year in February too. But do you feel like here with the injury? No, it not had nothing to do with the injury. No. Okay, so I, I'm meaning that like, did he get addicted to drugs because of the injury? He's trying to recover oh, quicker and get no, back soon. No, 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 no. Because he, he, he dies a year later. He only has a few real matches in between. So I was just kind of curious, I guess, kind of roundabout way of going about it. But did, did, did that injury have anything to do with him getting further and further with drug abuse? No, no. Okay. He was down the rabbit hole way before that. So. Technically, I guess one of his last matches there, last pay-per-view match, really. But uh, as far as Norman the Lunatic is concerned, he's backstage with a promo with Missy Hyatt, who looks great at this point. But what do you think about Norman Lunatic? What a weird gimmick. Yeah. Uh, very difficult. Buttonholed him. Uh, you know, he came from Calgary. They did a thing where he was Maha Singh. And they drew some money with him up there. But this was... Uh, it... it, it it's, What's the word I'm looking for? It buttonholed him into a very difficult position. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Definitely a weird gimmick. I guess maybe more for the kids, I guess, Norman the Lunatic. Yeah. 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 Kind of like a Dave Sullivan eventually or a Eugene gimmick. I mean, it's going down that rabbit hole. Right, right, right. So next up, we have Norman the Lunatic, and he's going to defeat Cactus Jack, a.k.a. Cactus Jack Manson, with you in the corner. The match goes nine minutes and 30 seconds. Norman gets the win. What do you think here? Uh, they were trying to get him over. Do you know what I mean? And uh, Cactus uh, knew how to work with him. They had pretty good chemistry, and it was a mistake we made with Cactus. He should have went over. Cactus bumps like crazy, though, in the match. He makes Norman yeah, look true. like a million bucks. And, of course, he almost tries to do a sunset flip on Norman. Norman sits down and gets him for the three count. But it is right. crazy. Like, Norman the Lunatic beats Cactus Jack. Like, when you look back and you're reading it, it's like, wow, Foley lost to Norman the Lunatic on pay-per-view, but young Foley, of course. Yeah. yeah. It's a whole different ballgame. Then we go to the back. Gordon Soley 
the legendary Gordon Soli, great announcer. He is with Jim Cornette and the Midnight Express, Bobby Eaton and Stan Lane for a nice little promo back there. Can't get better than Cornette on the mic, right? No. He's one of the best of all times. Then you say, we bro? have Midnight Express coming up for their match. Jim Cornette and the Midnight Express versus the Rock and Roll Express. The Rock and Roll Express, Ricky Morton and Robert Gibson defeated Eaton and Lane in 19 minutes and 30 seconds. A long match and an awesome match. This is a great match. Anybody want to go back and just kind of get the, I guess, the tail end of the rivalry between the Rock and Roll Express and the Midnight Express. Go watch this match and go watch this pay-per-view. Great match between these two. Just unbelievable as the Rock and Roll Express do end up getting the victory. Gibson pin lane for the win. AJP, hey, uh, I got to eat something right now. Can I eat while we're doing this? Or yeah, you yeah go, go for it. Okay. okay, go ahead. Yeah, go for it. So uh, the Rock and Roll Express get the win over the Midnight Express. Almost 20-minute match on the pay-per-view. So awesome stuff uh, for anybody that hasn't seen it. Well, I was down in uh, Chillicothe for Bobby Fulton's last week. Yep. And the Rock and Roll Express work with uh, the Barbarian and his partner. And they still can pop the house. It's unreal how Ricky is so good. And Robert, too. Wow, I didn't realize they were still wrestling. I thought they were had, yep. had retired. I thought they were done. That's awesome. Nice. This is their retirement tour. Oh, okay. Nice. I like that. R and R, baby, they're awesome. Love, love the uh, Rock and Roll Express. Speaking of great tag teams, we have the Road Warriors with Paul Ellering in the back, getting interviewed by Gordon Soley, and basically they're talking about their Chicago street fight, which is up next. It's going to be the Road Warriors, Hawk and Animal, with Paul Ellering defeating the skyscrapers, who I mentioned before is Mean Mark Callis and the Masked skyscraper mike you knows under the hood with teddy long match only goes about five minutes it's okay you know they come dressed as you are street fight and they all really start brawling all around nothing too special about it but the road warriors do end up getting the win any kind of memories of the this chicago street fight short and sweet only about five minutes yeah i mean it was uh just to get the road warriors over because we also had a substitution in there right yep so you know, you probably could have made a guy if they had plans for him. If he stood up and had a hell of a match against the Road Warriors. But it was just trying to, in my mind, it was just trying to fit a hole in the boat. You know what I mean? Fill a hole in the boat. And it was really kind of designed to have Road Warriors next feud with Doom because Doom comes out and they end up after the match throwing Teddy Long into Doom, which shows you that's Teddy Long's new team. He's going to be teaming with Doom. Doom and the Road Warriors start brawling all around, and then the Road Warriors sent Doom packing. Basically, that's going to be their next feud. Yeah, and as tough as the Road Warriors were, they weren't going to send Doom packing. Do you know what I mean? Doom, yep. they they were two tough guys. So basically, WWE decides to bring back the NWA United States Tag Team Championship. You know, give it another title belt, another tag team. Do you guys think you had enough tag teams for it? I mean, you do have a lot of tag teams. Do you think you had enough for two tag team belts? JP, they were looking at this. They were looking at running two towns a night and using top tag teams in different towns. So that's why they came up with that U.S. tag team. So basically a tournament was held to crown the new champions. Pillman and Zink defeated the Freebirds in the finals, which sets up this rematch for the NWA U.S. tag team titles. Brian Pillman and the Z-Man Tom Zink again defeated the fabulous Freebirds, Michael P.S. Hayes and Jimmy Jam Garvin to retain the NWA United States Tag Team Championships. The match went 24 minutes and 30 seconds. Okay match, not great, but man, why the heck did it get 25 minutes to, for this match? Because they thought it was going to be a very good match. Even more so than giving more time to rock and roll in midnight, huh? 
Well, it, no one locks it in that you got 20. You know, they probably said to Robert and, and Punky, uh, we'll give you 20 minutes. So they got it ready and they got home right at a 20 minute mark. We probably, they probably said to uh, the other guys, you got 20 minutes and they just went over five minutes. I mean, no one's hitting it uh, on the nose. Do you know what I mean? Very few yep. anyway. So Pillman and Zinc were kind of uh, put into the plans that like we're going to give these guys a bit of a push? Yeah, yeah. Two good-looking guys, great bodies. We draw on women, yeah. Crazy, though. You, you take out the Freebirds and you put them against the Midnight Express, and the Midnight Express had an awesome match with Zinc and Pillman. So, I mean, they had the ability, especially uh, Pillman at that point. I mean, they definitely had the ability to have a good match if they wanted to and if they had the right opponent. Yeah, Pillman was really moving up at the time. Next up, WCW, a.k.a. the NWA World Tag Team Championship. The Steiner brothers, Rick and Scott, defeated Ole and Arn Anderson in about 16 minutes. This was a good match. I don't know, one of those things where I feel like Arn Anderson and any partner that he's had over the years, whether it's Tully, whether it's Eaton, whether, you know, whoever it is, it, he always ends up wrestling the Steiner brothers. And he always ends up getting suplexed a lot. But great match here. Uh, maybe not as good as, as it could have been. Ole was maybe slowing down, I guess, at this point. But good match, nonetheless. Steiner brothers get the win. You like the Steiners and the Andersons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it was uh, a good match. Ole was starting to wind down. So I carried the load. They were going to Japan. So if you pull Scotty out of there, there's no reason for Rick, you know, me show up, make sense to the people. Next up, Lex Luger is in the back with Gordon Soley. They're talking about his title match coming up next in the main event against the Nature Boy, Ric Flair. And then we cut to another interview with Gordon Soley. And he's got Woman Oh Woman, Won't You Marry Me Now, who you know very well, and her new stable man, the Nature Boy, Ric Flair, as she's now managing the Four Horsemen. Right. Do you like woman with Nate? Do you like yeah, that combination? Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. They look good I together. Know, later on, too, in, in 95, she rejoins the Horseman as well, and she's with Flair again. Definitely a right. good fit for the Horseman. Right, right. More so than Doom, right? I mean, better. Yeah. she fits better with them. Right. But that was also that there was a white girl with black guys, so. Right. Yep. To uh, come into leaving the dark ages, hopefully. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah. So here we go. The main event of the evening. Ric Flair, the NWA World Heavyweight Champion with Woman, defending his title against Lex Luger. This match goes 38 minutes, and Ric Flair ends up getting the victory via countout to retain the NWA world title. This is an awesome match. This is a classic flair. I guess you could say is carrying Luger a bit here, but Luger does. He's well on, on his own. I mean, he can carry himself a little bit too, but obviously this is a great job by flair. What do you think here of flair defeating Luger via count out in the main event? Yeah. I mean, they were trying to save Luger, but uh, Rick was carrying, like you said, and, Rick was the champion. The champion needed to go over. Great match. Maybe the ending a bit disappointing because it's a count out. Do you like that count out finish on, on a pay-per-view? Not really, but they were trying to save Luger. You know, they, we just had lost Sting. We couldn't afford to beat Luger. You know, we didn't know how long Sting was going to be out. What would you have done? Would you have beaten right. him? No, you, you kind of can't because yeah. God knows if you beat him, you got who who's next? You got nobody yeah. else. Right, right. And you had to continue on with Rick. You know. And when you think about it too, he's he's going to take the loss right in his count out to keep him strong. But also the way that he lost by a count out, you guys kept it strong because what happened was Sting is out there in crutches with the big knee brace on. 
he's telling woman to stop interfering you. He's trying to help Luger, but Arn and Ole come out and they run past him. They go in the ring. They beat up Luger behind the ref's back, which then Sting wants to get involved. So then Arn and Ole go after Sting. That gets Luger's attention, takes Luger out of the ring. The crowd is right. super into it. Luger then starts beating up Arn and Ole, sending them packing. Doesn't notice a nine, 10 gets counted out. So it's not like the action was so slow as something was going on. You didn't know what was going on and boom, he loses. So it was done well. I mean, it, it was pretty exciting. Yeah, and that was to save Luger because they didn't have anybody ready except him. So it served its purpose. Plus, you had a pay-per-view coming up in a few months called Capital Combat, and you needed an opponent for Flair, which is right. Luger again in the rematch, so you had to keep him strong. Right, exactly. Really interesting. I don't know if anybody else noticed this or not, but Ross called the next pay-per-view. He didn't call it Capital Combat. He called it Armed and Dangerous. So was that ever supposed to be the name of the pay-per-view? Because not, not that I know of. Okay, because I don't know. Maybe he thought it was, or something, but obviously it's Capital Combat. It's not Armed and Dangerous. It's Capital yeah. Combat. I have no idea. Overall, what do you think about this pay-per-view? Uh, you had some good matches. I got to give it a thumbs up because of not having Sting. Luger did a hell of a job. Rick, of course, did his magnificent job. The Rock and Roll had a great match. Uh, it was, I think it was a positive pay per view. What do you give it? I could probably give it a thumbs up just because I liked your match, you and Buzz versus Dynamic Dudes. I like Stan, uh, the Steiners versus the Andersons. I love Rock and Roll Express versus Midnight Express. It was awesome. And I love Flair and Luger going almost 40 minutes in a classic. So I, I give it a thumbs up just because the, the pay-per-view itself, the matches were good. Right, right. So Maybe could have done without Norman the, the Lunatic, and maybe it would have may have had the Freebirds match be a little shorter. But, you know, can't complain too much. No, I think it was well done. And even the Road Warriors, their street fight wasn't bad. It's just it was maybe just too short. So it was almost more of a building the storyline with Teddy Long and Doom than than the match needed right. to be any good. 